when you think of geometry, probably what comes to mind is the familiar geometry of lines, circles, and all sorts of cool constructions like this one to create a hexagon. But there are many different fascinating geometries, like the hyperbolic geometry that we're going to investigate in this video, that prove just as valid as the geometry we all know and love. This video is sponsored by Brilliant, more about them at the end of the video. Our story begins over 2,000 years ago in the time of the ancient Greeks with Euclid, who's often known as the father of geometry. Euclid's book on geometry, The Elements, is still considered one of the most influential mathematical books of all time. What Euclid did that was so special was to create an axiomatic treatment of geometry. And what this means is that you split all of the possible statements about geometry into two different categories. One is axioms, or often called postulates. And the idea here is this is a statement that is so completely obvious that we're all just going to agree that it's true. Something like, between any two points, you can draw a unique line segment between them. Obvious, right? The idea here is that we're not proving that a postulate is true from some more fundamental truths. We're making the choice to accept it as true in the geometry that we're trying to construct. And then after you've accepted all of the different postulates, and in Euclid's case there are five of them, then everything else that you do, all of those are going to be theorems, where you try to prove theorem after theorem based on the five underlying axioms that you've accepted. For example, that hexagon construction we saw earlier, this is just theorem number 15 of book 4 of Euclid's Elements, all proven based on those underlying postulates. And so you get this kind of enormous mathematical edifice from these underlying very obvious and basic assumptions that we just make the choice to accept. Okay, so we saw the first postulate already, that between two points you can draw a line segment. What are the others? The second is that if you have a line segment already, you can extend it as far as you wished into a line. The third says that given a center point in some radius, you can draw a circle. The fourth is that right angles are right angles, but no matter where you draw them, all right angles are the same. So all four of those axioms are just pretty straightforward, very reasonable things to accept. But the fifth postulate, that's where it gets a little bit weirder. The fifth postulate says the following. If you start with a line, and then you consider some point that is not on the line, then there is at most one other line that is going to never intersect the original line. That is, we're saying, given some starting line, you could always construct a parallel line to it. And it's reasonable, right? If I tilt my ruler a little bit, I see that the other lines that I might draw are either going to intersect the original on the page, or you can sort of imagine that they're going to intersect the original, you know, somewhere off of the page. So this fifth postulate, which we often call the parallel postulate, it's not that it's completely unreasonable. I mean, it still sort of intuitively seems like that's probably true. But it's more cumbersome, more involved than the other postulates. It's, it's some claim about what's going to eventually happen at some point. This fifth postulate, it feels like, can't I prove that? Is that really the kind of underlying bedrock assumption I need to make? Or instead, could this fifth postulate really be proven as a theorem that depends on the previous four? Do I really need to have it here as a postulate? Even Euclid, the first 28 theorems of the elements, are all based on only those first four postulates. He's trying to be able to prove as much as he can without needing that fifth postulate. Now, for millennia, literally millennia, mathematicians tried to prove the fifth postulate as a theorem if you only accept the first four, a project that they never managed to do. Now, to be clear, there are other geometries that people knew about and were interested in. For example, spherical geometry, the geometry of living on the surface of a sphere, something us humans should all be interested in. If you have two points, like say the North Pole and the South Pole, well, what is a line between them? I'll model it with my elastic. A line could just be a great circle or a portion of a great circle. I could add some more lines. Let's put on, for example, another great circle here, and I'll do one more again. 
And we can study the geometry of what it's like to live on this surface. You know, right, for example, right here, there's a nice little triangle, and we can study properties of triangles that occur on spheres. But this spherical geometry is really different from the Euclidean geometry that we were just talking about. Because, for example, not even the first of the axioms is satisfied. If I take the top and the bottom here, these two poles, we'll see that, in fact, there's infinitely many different ways that I could draw a great circle that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. So there's no way that I can uniquely define the appropriate line segment between two points. This doesn't even satisfy the first axiom. So what I really want to find is some geometry that accepts the first four axioms, but rejects the fifth one. Because if I can do that, then I know that the fifth one is not provable based on just the first four alone. This brings us to Janos Bojai, a 19th century Hungarian mathematician. And Bojai is a fascinating character in the history of mathematics, but I actually really like his father, who did similar work before him and had this delightful quote to give to his son. You must not attempt this approach of parallels. I have traversed this bottomless night, which extinguished all light and joy in my life. I entreat you, leave the science of parallels alone. <laughs> Fortunately for us, he did not listen to his father. What Boyer did was construct such a consistent geometry, which we now call hyperbolic geometry, that accepts the first four postulates of Euclidean geometry, but rejects the fifth. This is the so-called Poincaré disk. And the idea is you can live inside of this disk, but you cannot step outside of it. You can't even step onto the boundary circle. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two points A and B inside of my Poincaré disk, and I want to try and define what do I mean by a hyperbolic line segment between them, a, a type of line segment that was going to obey, well, the different axioms of Euclidean geometry, most of them. And then one thing I know is that if I have two points A and B, there are many different circles that lie between them. And all of these circles are possible circles that just have A and B on them. But there is exactly one possible circle, maybe it looks somewhere around there, where the intersections there and there with the boundary circle form 90 degrees. So that is to say there are many different circles between two points, but there is only one orthogonal circle between these two points, orthogonal in the sense that it comes and intersects the boundary circle at 90 degrees. Now, I'm doing all this, by the way, using software called GeoGebra. The link is down in the description. And I've taken standard GeoGebra and I've customized it with a few special tools that will allow us to do hyperbolic geometry really nicely. So now I'm going to define what I mean by a hyperbolic line segment. So I click the hyperbolic line segment button and I'm going to select A and B here. And basically this portion, this portion of that special circle, this orthogonal circle that goes between A and B, I'm going to call that a line segment in hyperbolic geometry. This gives me the line segment. If I want to give the actual line, I'm going to go and click hyperbolic line between A and B, and it extends it all the way out to the boundary circle. So what we've established is the first two postulates that Euclid came up. Between any two points, I can come up with a line segment between them. And it doesn't matter how I move my points around. No matter what I do with the A and the B, there's always a uniquely defined length segment between them. Second postulate is that given a line segment, I can extend it into a full line. This is my definition of a full line, and again, I can do that. I can also come up here and give the idea of a circle. A hyperbolic circle is just a Euclidean circle. There's no difference except for the restriction that the hyperbolic circle has to live fully inside of the Poincaré disk. I can't have something like this where part of it's inside and part of it's outside. That's gonna give me the third axiom, Angles we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. But now let me talk about the parallel postulate, the fifth one. That's where all the special stuff happens. Because consider this first line that I have established already. Now let me imagine that I'm going to come here and I'm going to put in just some other point. How about that point over there? I'm going to call this one C. If the parallel postulate was true, then there would be exactly one line that goes through C but does not intersect the original hyperbolic line that I have. But if I come here and I start at C, 
then, then what we're seeing here is that there's actually infinitely many other hyperbolic lines that go through the point C that do not go through the original line. This tells us that the parallel postulate is false. There is not exactly one line that is parallel to the original. Perhaps there's a couple here that are special. For example, if I take this D point and take it right down to this intersection here, maybe this one I could call parallel. I have this other parallel line that goes between the other intersection point with the boundary circle and C. I'll make those two red just for convenience. But then if I take any curve that starts in here, any of those ones that lie in this sort of region in between these two different red curves, I could even go all the way up into the middle here, anywhere over there, all of those are not intersecting my original line. So what we've really done here with hyperbolic geometry is we've put that age old question to the rest. Yes, we can find a geometry, a consistent geometry that accepts the first four postulates but rejects the fifth one and thus that fifth postulate cannot be proven from the first four alone. To be clear, we have skipped over a lot of the hard work of showing that this geometry is consistent, but that's what Boyaye and others that followed him were able to do. The next thing I'm going to talk about is angles. So let me imagine that I have two different line segments, and I'm really interested in how should I define this angle down here at this point B? I can see as I move it around here that that angle is actually going to change. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to come up with some tangent lines. At B, I'll take a tangent line to the first curve and similarly at B to the second curve. These are Euclidean lines, they're not related to hyperbolic geometry, but I'm going to use them to define something in hyperbolic geometry. So as I move my B around, you can sort of see how those tangents are going to be changing. Then I define the angle at B to be the angle between the tangent lines. And now I have a nice definition of what the angle is. Closing this up into being a triangle, I can contrast this hyperbolic triangle with the Euclidean triangle that could be formed by just taking straight lines in the Euclidean sense between these two different points. For a Euclidean triangle, we know that the sum of the interior angles always adds up to 180 degrees. But watch what happens here. I'm going to drag the A all the way over there, I'm going to drag the B down here, and I'm going to drag the C over here, just to make the difference between my Euclidean triangle and my hyperbolic triangle particularly uh, apparent. For the Euclidean triangle, the interior angles, as always, have to add up to 180 degrees. They look sort of roughly close to 60 each in this case. But notice how small the hyperbolic angles are going to be. And indeed, if I take these all the way to the very, very edge, those angles are approaching zero. And so by taking the A, the B, and the C and putting them as close to the boundary as I wish, I can make the sum of those interior angles approaching as close to zero as I wish. In contrast, if I come here and I put all of my points really close together and towards the center, well, I can't even tell the difference at this level of resolution between a hyperbolic triangle and a Euclidean one. So in this case, the sum of those interior angles starts approximating pi. So this is just one of those quirks of hyperbolic geometry where the sum of the interior angles of triangles is not always just pi or 180 degrees. It can be all sorts of things between zero and pi at the outer edges. So this is just scratching the surface of what we can talk about with hyperbolic geometry, but it's so cool. So play around with creating all sorts of fun, different hyperbolic geometry objects. If you really want to master geometry, then I would highly recommend the sponsor for today's video, which is Brilliant. Brilliant has a whole ton of different courses, but in particular, they have an entire sequence dedicated to geometry. And it's just delightfully interactive. For example, if I have two different prisms with the same height and width and length, do they have the same volume? Well, as I grab the toggle and sort of move around, I can nicely visualize exactly what the two shapes are. And I'm going to naively guess, uh, perhaps I think prism B is going to have a larger amount. L let's just see if my guess is correct. Sadly, it is incorrect, but look what Brilliant does. It's helping me to see the visualization of how if I take these two different prisms and slide them over, but I then increase the number of slices, I can start to see that, yes, those two things are supposed to be exactly equal. If I slide all the way over to the right here, then we really start to get that nice visualization that, yes, these two volumes are exactly the same. 
as a professor, I know that this is just a really effective way to learn where you're getting your hands dirty, you're playing around, you're manipulating the objects and are able to visualize and understand exactly what is going on. You're tested on it to make sure you really understand and you get those explanations if you screw up. This is why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett and sign up for free. In addition, the first 200 people to click the link down in the description will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, I very much hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.